No, it's okay. Good. Oh, okay, good enough. Okay, do you have to? Yeah, this one already. Well, that's it. So, do you want to use it? Okay, so I'm going to try to tag you. Yep, we can hear you. Right here? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you are coming. How are you here? Hello. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Can you help? We live in the office. We can hear you. <laughs> yes, okay, we can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
Okay. 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 Yeah, we are about from. Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, today we have a very. We're gonna get a very good session because uh, we have on um, people from a particular mind. And then they're going to talk about something very new to us here today. So we're very lucky, right? And uh, we have two presenters today. Okay. Yeah. 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 Large complex project and has a proven track record of success in leading and managing complex projects throughout North America, South America, and Australia. She is also experienced in developing and implementing innovative solutions to geotechnical challenges. Her specific areas of expertise include rock characterization, where she specialized in data analysis, data visualization, and quantifying uncertainties in large complex data sets. The no other presenter we have also is Bijan P. Bijan is a project rock mechanics engineer with six years of experience in advanced numerical modeling and project development in rock mechanics and geotechnical engineering. He's leading the numerical modeling team, focusing on diverse, diverging large scale modeling projects and developing custom tools and applications to provide scalable producible and reliable solution for clients. He has been extensively involved in several stability analysis projects with uh, 2D and 3D stability analysis for large open pits, mine and underground mines in US, Canada, Australia, and Indonesia, Chile, and Mexico. Let's put our hands together for our two presenters as they can present Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um... Yeah, today we're gonna give a presentation on uh, our topic, uh, a closer look into mining rock mechanics with a real life example from Bingham Canyon Mine. Um, and thank you for the introductions. Uh, uh, you want to be on the camera? Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Do you want to be you close can, to the? Yeah, you can stay here, and then she she be talking, and when you want to change someone. All right. Then, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. And once again, yeah, Anna Kate and Bijan here. Um, and as we work in mining and safety is a big part of everything we do, we'll start off uh, with a safety share like we do all of our meetings and at work. Um, just to make sure we keep focus on safety at all times. Um, so for today, just wanted to bring up an incident from a site recently uh one of the drivers was driving on a port road headed uh out with yeah. material and uh off the road saw about a herd of a 300 elk which as you can imagine is a bit of a distraction um as well as a distraction though the elk were far away you know you're concerned about animals like yeah. un unpredictable could run towards the road while he was focusing on the elk um, the wheel of his truck slightly nicked the edge of the road and the truck actually rolled off the road. He was fine. There was just damage to equipment. But um, the overall point here is there's going to be roadside distractions and you have to be aware of what the real dangers are. Keep your eye on on the task in front of you. Um, and so, yeah, that's our that's our distract. And that happened, you know, in every relation. You're just driving on the road, you're stopping, you know, at a stop sign, you know, and then this distractions could happen. So that's just highlighting that every time we are working on the task, just make sure we give our full attention to just executing that, you know. Okay. 
All right. Excellent. Okay, so then for our for our presentation today, we're going to start off with just a quick overview of equilibrium mining um, over who we are, um, and then there's lights up, yeah. And then after giving a brief overview, we're going to talk a little bit more about what we do um, at equilibrium mining, specifically um, rock mass characterization. Uh, and computational simulations. And then also we're gonna talk a little bit about monitoring and how those three things all have to operate in a feedback loop in order to ensure successful mine design. And then finally, we're gonna talk about our, our case study of the, the Leo failure at Bingham Canyon Mine and how these elements of rock mass characterization, site monitoring and computer simulations helped us um, achieve a successful back analysis of the failure event. So yeah, the first, you know, before you go forward, you would, you know, go over, you know, who we are. Yeah, I'm just gonna go to the next one quickly here. You know, very equilibrium mining, you know, fairly new to the business, but the people that, you know, are with the company, they've been around for like quite a long time. Uh, and then, you know, last year, you know, we, we sort of came together, uh, you know, to establish like a, a highly technical team, basically to focus on the rock mechanics issues for both open field and, you know, underground mining. And, you know, as, as you can see, we have like different offices, you know, around the globe as well. Um, yeah, just a few things about us. Uh, yeah, as our name says, we bring equilibrium big focus on, uh, you know, equality and bringing diversity into, into the team. Um, and our, our mission here is we want to uh, create the space where excellence is the norm, people are fulfilled, and our uh, client customers are our advocates. Basically, we want to foster technical excellence um, and have our, our name speak for itself. Um, within that, um, our kind of core values then um, goes along that we have we have technical excellence so we're, we're innovators that's really what we want to do we want to start with state of the art and then improve from there and really be the option for for our clients if they need an innovative uh, and new solution um, and along with that you can't be offering new solutions without also offering quality um, reliability uh, and then also we we do go up to site and as we stated, you know, mining's dangerous business. So health and safety always has to be on the forefront um, and then along with diversity and respect. Yeah, which is, you know, they all, they came at the end, but they're not least, you know, these oh. are on the top of the, the priorities that we have. You know, we always look for opportunities to foster diversity, to, you know, include, you know, as many different ideas. And, you know, we sort of, you know, don't don't think about anything, just, you know, bringing the good vibes to the team and then, you know, the best ideas to execute the projects. And then th these projects range everything from just the, the start, so scoping studies all the way through closure studies for the mine. We offer a variety of services. Um, and, you know, we have, we have a lot of people on the team that have various technical, operational, and, and backgrounds. Um, and basically, like we said, goal is to bring technical excellence. Um, Great. Going to the next one, you know, here, you know, it's basically, you know, just a few bullet points of the things that we try to bring into the mining more. You know, like, you know, we're not basically trying to, you know, do everything in the conventional way. We try to bring in more uh, of these new technologies, like, you know, programming. We have developed so many different, you know, tools and scripts to, you know, uh, actually take uh, care of a lot of the processes, we streamline things to make sure that we, you know, can, you know, have a better and re reliable, you know, um, services. Going to the next one, this is just a, you know, a quick glance of the projects that we're currently working on, you know, just to name a few, like, you know, Bingham Canyon has been like a long, you know, a client for us. We have been working on that and, you know, a couple of projects in North America, you know, Canada, even Australia and, you know, um, all the other places. Right to the next one. All right. Now that we gave a little brief overview of who we are, we're going to go into more of what we do. Um, and for this, uh, we would just, before we jump into some more specifics, we wanted to, we wanted to highlight one of the, 
the overarching kind of uh, you know points of our talk here is that though we're going to walk through these things kind of individually and touch on each throughout, um, we want to highlight this is not a linear process. We're not doing characterization and simulations and then, you know, following it up with monitoring on site. Um, this is a constant feedback loop. We, in order for these projects to be successful, all the teams need to be talking to each other. You know, each aspect needs to be constantly informing the other in order to improve each piece, though, so just to initial reminder. With that, I'm going to talk about rock mass characterization. Um, so with rock mass characterization for large open pit mines, there's a, a large number of challenges. Um, you can have really geologically complex sites um, where rock has a lot of, and, and its qualities has a lot of spatial variability. You might have limited data, so you could have uncertainty in your rock mass. Um, and yeah, and also, depending on when that data was collected and how it was stored, you might have limited data confidence. Um, so our process in order to try and handle these challenges generally, um, we, we try to increase reliability of the data by completing rigorous QAQC, um, give higher data confidence. Um, we wanna increase efficiency by using automation um, so that we can eliminate potential for human error. We can also reduce repetitive tasks and give the engineers more time to do engineering and think about the big issues. Um, in addition, we use automation to help us increase scalability um, and also just having um, really repeatable processes helps us with scaling up that data, whether we're working on a small, small data set or something really large and adding new data in. Um, and then a big thing also is we want to make sure we have transparency. We want our clients to know um, everything we do. They can take a look. Um, we're not trying to hide exactly. anything. We want to. We want full confidence that way. Um, so this helps us handle all of these challenges um, with that. So um, our first step in ca characterization is usually data review. When we come in, there's usually data available, um, or you know we're starting to collect it. Um, and when we're when we're looking at this data, you know, there's there's a big difference in how we're going to look at things. Whether we're at a uh, we have like a, at a smaller project versus a larger mine. So there's some places where we're going to have small, like minimal or low confidence in data, and this could be in mines that are, you know, either in exploration sites where they don't have a lot of data. Um, you know, sometimes closure sites where the data is quite old or hasn't been, um, you know, hasn't been fully QA'd. Um, and in those ones, it's going to rely a lot more on engineering judgment. The models are going to be a bit simpler because we just don't, we don't have the data to inform. Whereas at our larger sites, uh, you know, there's a lot of data and there's different challenges. The challenges more are related to how do we interpret all of this? What do we use? How do we make sense of this large database? And how do we, you know, make sure it's clear what we're doing with all this data? Yeah. We have so much data in these large projects that we can we kind of have to like make our way through it and then kind of realize that okay, how we can make use of of all of these drilling, all of these mappings that are done, are being done. Because like you know when you don't have the data, then you don't have the problem of like processing them. You know thinking about how to optimize the process. You know but when you have this much data and and which you can see in the next slides. Well, yeah, I guess just saying for you know. These, these problems where we don't have a lot of data, these sites, those are really complex because um, you have to make a lot of decisions based on very limited data. Um, today, we are, because we're, you know, our case study is Big M Canyon Mine and it is a huge mine uh, with a lot of data, mostly going to focus on the challenges related to the really large and complex data sets, but not to minimize this is really, this side of the, this side of the page is really challenging as well. Yeah. Um, all right, so our data review, we have a ton of data. We have a lot of you know, structural data from logging, um, structural mapping. We have strength data from laboratory testing. We have drill hole data, and these all of this data are built into different models. And you know, we have to review all of this, see what you know, what's reliable, what we want to use, and you know, how best to use it. So, I mean, the this is just a, an idea. There's a lot 
to start with. Um, and just to focus on a quick one or, you know, an example here for some of the challenges that we're going to have with, you know, making sure we have good quality control over this data. I mean, starts, uh, this is just a, an example for, for core logging data and data that will eventually be built into a, a like a geotechnical block model, like a GSI or RMR block model. Um, it starts with the core logging, you know, you could have, you have all sorts of uncertainties. You don't know, you know, some core loggers have a lot of experience, some don't, you know. Sometimes there's input errors in, you know, while people are recording things in the field. Also, even just transitioning core out of the hole or, you know, to wherever the core is logged, there's chances that there's damage. There's a lot of uncertainty that lies in this. And then you take a data set that may have some errors, may have some uncertainty. And, you know, we then have to build a database of all of this drill hole data. Um, again, managing large amounts of data and making sure it's clear, you know, where everything is coming from is very important. Um, and, you know, you have to deal with sometimes inconsistent data types. If some holes were logged a long time ago, they may have switched their processes up. Um, so again, challenges there. And then those are then compounded into a model that looks really detailed and impressive, but, you know, it's very important to know everything that's going into it so that it's, you know, you're not missing areas because looking at that right there, there's no way to just take a look at that image and say, oh, over there doesn't look right. You know, it's very, there's a very detailed process yeah. going into it. So to handle all of this, we have to implement little pieces along the way. Let's go. Um, so yeah, for the core logging, things that we can do to make it easier are um, automating QAQC where possible. There are certain entries into your core logs that, you know, they should be bounded. There's going to be a certain data type. They should have certain, you know, we're, we're expecting certain things. So you can quickly kind of write scripts programs to go through that and flag all the immediate errors. The next thing that we can do to increase QAQC is make sure there's a quick feedback loop between, um, between the loggers and the people who are reviewing. So especially if there's a new logger, make sure you're reviewing their work right away, getting feedback, making sure we're having the best quality data. And then you know, something that's just kind of coming into play now, and that's going to be, you know, great opportunity in the future is relogging a lot of these images with machine learning. Um, you know, machine learning techniques can help us at log RQD, fracture frequency, a lot of these things, and we're, you know, stuff we're developing now. Um, and that's a great check. You know, you still need the people to log it, but it's sure. a great check. Anyway, moving forward to all of this, huge pieces or just database management, automate, I mean, I think aut yeah. automating whatever possible really yeah. helps us because. Something to mention about automation, we don't want to like hide all the process from the engineer and, and sort of say, hey, like say, don't worry about anything. And then there might be some errors or bugs, but that could happen. But the, and the way that automation can help us is first of all, the engineer understand what he's automating. Like understand the process and understand how to debug the code. These are the two pieces that, that you know the engineer who is developing that should you know know. And then like yes, once we do that, you know with some you know rigorous QA QCs, then we can say okay, we automate this a small piece, you know. And then like you know as we go forward, we can build upon it. We don't want to like you know eliminate everything from the engineer and just you know make a black box that just just generates the results for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, for for example, we're just trying to make it easier. For example, we can automate you know, cutting sections through that that block model, overlaying it with the drill holes that are that are relevant to that section, and pulling up the drill core. You know, in that way, engineers not spending time like doing manual processes. They just get the output. They can look at it, and then you you know make sure that these the data is looking good, making sense, and it's kind of passing that engineering judgment. And in that high pace of you know working in these projects, we need engineers to focus more or spend more time in inter interpreting the results as opposed to actually making the plots. Mm -hmm. You know, like we uh, eliminate that part, then the engineer comes in and then figure out, okay, we have data gaps here. We don't have the you know the right you know uh, uh, for example uh, block model compared to the core logging. Great. So yeah, after we make sure we were, you know, we feel good about the data, we QAQC, we have we have our databases under control. You know, the next the next challenge is you know taking all of that data and developing geotechnical parameters to put into those models, um, which comes with its own 
giant set of challenges. Um, you know, you have to decide what's the most appropriate way to model all of that. Um, so, I mean, just for, for purposes of today, we're going to do it, just talk through an example of looking at uh, in text or anything, kind of focusing on uh, quantifying uncertainty. So, so your typical um, like hook round plot, you're going to fit, you're going to fit a best fit to your data. And that gives you a value. Um, but something that we know is really important is to give clients, to give the people who are going to use this data further down the line an idea of how certain are we in that value, not just saying here are your parameters. We want to make sure that there's a better understanding of, yeah, you know, there's, I don't know, you look at this data, there's, you could draw a line through a lot of places here. Um, and we do certain things, we, you know, we try and do our best. We use some, you know, we try to use some computational analysis to, to incorporate both, you know, engineering judgment um, and, and these best fits to, to predict maybe a range of what we're going to have here. Um, this is just one example. We use this Bayesian method um, to try to show, like, there, there's a range in this data, and it also can help, you know, give us an indication of our, our correlation between parameters. Um, so, you know, this is important um, because when we're looking at the data, there's a lot of different issues you can come up with. Now, these were both, you know, both, these are data sets that are both, it was from one rock type. Um, clearly for this one, we can see, yes, there's a fit through the data, but no, it doesn't really, it's not really helping because it seems like it could prep that fit. You could draw the line anywhere. But with this one, we, we do have a lot of data. So this is one of those cases where we're then going to use kind of, you know, we're going to use some automated processes to start filtering through that data and looking what kind of data combinations, what other pieces of this data, what are aspects of each of these tests? How can we separate it out? Which ones actually make sense? Um, for something like the one on the right though, there's not a lot of data. Splitting it out is only going to, you know, you might get a better fit, but it's only to a few points and it might give a false sense of certainty. So that one, that one's more where we just have to make sure that everyone down the line knows we're not so sure about this. We might need more data here or don't feel so, you know, don't feel super confident in all these. Um, and then on the left also, you can, you should, you know, account for that spatial variability too. Like mm -hmm. these samples were, you know, collected from all over the pit. Mm -hmm. And that unit was like, you know, expanded, you know, across the pit as well. So like at each, you know, location, you would have different conditions, you know, especially in the large, large open pit mines. Yeah. So yeah, that's, uh, yeah, this is just showing here how we're going to quickly have, you know, so you know, scripts spit out a bunch of different plots showing, okay, which different parameters can we look at? Which ones make sense for splitting out this data? And you can see here, there's some, there's ones that make look like a little bit better than others. And then we can quickly kind of go through this and say, all right, where we have, you know, alteration, we're going to split the unit. And also we could, there's an option of maybe splitting it by, by hardness. Uh, maybe you could split it out by locate pit wall, but it's not as clear. So we kind of have an idea of moving forward what we can do. And it's a quick way of doing that without having to, you know, mess in an Excel sheet for hours. Yep. Um, and then the last piece here is after we kind of have our data, um, we want to refine that. Um, so especially in cases where we, you know, have, we have areas of concern in the pit or weak units where we want to have more confidence in that because that's going to be controlling our stability or areas where we have high uncertainty that we want to improve that confidence. And so one, you can gather more data. That's that's an option and, you know, reevaluate models or another awesome, or, you know, great way of refining these parameters is using data from pit monitoring. So particularly when there's been movements in the pit, um, this is super helpful because if, you know, when monitoring equipment captures movements in the pit, you have real data on something that really happened. You know, when it moved, how much it moved, which direction it moved, and you can then take your data, put it into a model and see, does our characterized data match this movement or does it not? And that's a really, really, really useful tool for helping refine your inputs. Um, and so with that, I will hand it over to Bijan for modeling. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, so like, you know. I'll click. You, I think he wants you to stand yeah. on the thing. Yeah. 
Good. And so like, uh, you know, we talk about now at the, up to this point, you know, we have now so much data to work with in the rock mass characterization. We have so many uncertainties, but, you know, we found ways to get past that and we now get to the, you know, computer simulation part, which is not just, you know, flag 3D modeling or like, you know, slide modeling. It's a, like a combination of different techniques that we use to be able to, you know, make sense out of the data that we collect and the testing that we do so that we have some means to compare to actually, you know, what is happening in the pit, which is the slope monitoring. So these are the, you know, the challenges that you just listed here. Like when you want to do the simulation, that has to be tailor-made to your, to your uh, problem. Or it has to be like, you know, uh, optimized if you have a large, large project that you have, you have and you see under like, you know, high pressure in terms of the time and the quality. Or for example, sometimes, the conventional methods might not even work for you when you come to come across these challenges in the in the in the mining. And then, like you know, as we go forward, we have so many new technologies, and it's just hard to keep up, you know, with all of that and try to bring everything in. So, you know, in this section, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that we did, you know, to address these challenges. We can first start with the the multiple ubiquitous joint model that we have. Uh, so, you know, when we wanted to do the Leo back analysis, you know, back in 20, I think 21 it was, and uh, FLAG 3D only, you know, offered one ubiquity, you know, per model or per each zone. So what, you know, we can see over there, we have so many joint sets, so many, you know, the different orientations that we have in the actual reality, but we could only use one of them for like a big, you know, geological unit. So what we did, can uh, put it down, that one too. So we, that was the first example that, you know, that's the default, the first joint in the in flag, and then we add the two additional joints too, just so that we can, you know, capture more uh, data from the field, you know, in the model. So that was something that we had to add to the existing, you know, flag 3D software, uh, which right, right now they, you know, already added it into what, the packages, but we have our, our own version as well. The next one is the process optimization. Imagine you have this, you know, complicated model, but you know, you have to make sure all the properties are correct. They are reflective of the characterization. And also the, re the results, you know, are reliable to present to the client. So what we do now, we streamline everything. And whenever we click go and we click run on a model, you know, you can actually, you know, see all the properties, model configurations uploaded to a database. Sometimes, you know, we use the power. BI, just because it's a platform that, you know, is already established, but now we are working on, you know, actually making a, a custom website just so that we can be transparent with our clients. And for ourselves as well, we can know, we have, we run hundreds and hundreds of models and we can know, okay, what's in these models, like what's the characterization, you know, that we use in the models, right? And that was, that is, uh, I think, one of the bigger, you know, issues with this uh, advanced modeling there are complicated models, but nobody knows what's in it. You know, nobody knows, like, you know, what block model you use, what properties you use, right? So we try to, like, you know, break that and then be completely transparent with the client. Sure, we run 200 iterations to get the calibration, but, you know, those are all adding values to us to have a better understanding of the failure. Next one. Uh, yeah, so the next thing that, for example, is not completely related to the advanced modeling is when we, we have the pit design, you know, when you want to do bench scale or interim scale designs where people use conventional kinematic tools. On the left, we have a uh, we, have, we have a block and a bench that this block can, you know, kinematically fail out of this uh, bench. But what if the block is, you know, has this piece of rock mass right in front of it? In the conventional, you know, software like you know, uh, S wedge, for example, you know, they can do this perfectly. But when it comes to that, they say the block is kinematically inadmissible. So that was a challenge for us, and we had to overcome it, you know, because the projects that we had, they had so many of these blocks with weak rock mass in front of them that they technically could fail in reality, but in the conventional methods, you couldn't see them, you know, failing. So we had to do that custom tool for the composite, the, the kinematics. So all that said, you know, now we, we're here talking about this advanced modeling. In the middle, you can see this con the conventional method of running a flag 3D project. 
you know, they have like, you know, back in the day, it used to be like multiple people needed to work on this project. Right now, with these processes, we, we only need two. Or for example, when it comes to the calibration, it used to take like months and, uh, and months for us to be able to achieve it. But right now, we actually, the phase one of that Leo calibration, we did it in one month, for example. Or, uh, you know, when, when it comes to innovation, those models are, are, are already so complex and people are having, you know, issues to understand them, then there is no room for innovation. And because of that, you know, high pace and like, you know, and less, you know, or limited time, you are very, you know, in a hard uh, uh, position to actually, you know, implement any innovation. But when you automate that and, you know, scale it up, you can, you know, actually permit innovation too. So we can go to the next one as well. So, okay, we did all that to get to this, you know, part that I, I think, you know, is probably interesting to people uh, might have heard of this failure, you know, in the new too. So we're going to focus on the, this, you know, open pit mine in the, you know, southwest, southwest of uh, Salt Lake City. You know, I'm sure everybody have heard of it in on Canyon. And this area that is highlighted is just the area of the Leo failure. Going to the next one to look at the um, image of the failure. That's the before. That's like on May 31st, 2021, when the failure happens. And this is almost like as, as high as the Imperial State building. It's like quite high. The case in Hingham Canyon like is hard to you know exactly understand because it's like a huge money. From the bottom to the top, it's almost two months. Uh, in May, it failed. That's on the right, 19 million tons of material came down. Uh, but, you know, since they have like a very rigorous, you know, monitoring systems and, you know, um, triggers in place, you know, they first detected it in March 2020 when, you know, they knew it's, this, is, this area is critical and it's kind of going to move. But they were, they, applied, they uh, implemented this observ observational mining method, which might be new to some people. And that's the that's concept that they use. They basically, every time that they blast, they wait like three hours before they go and attempt to take the material out. This is just one sort of thing that, that they do to make sure that, you know, they can actually extract as much as material they, they can without jeopardizing the personal and equipment. In March 2021, though, they realized that this slope is, you know, past the, the, the time that they can actually, you know, remediate it. So, you know, they continue to do the monitoring. They had the prisms over there. They had the thermal camera pointing at it as well. And three days prior to the failure, they took out everything. They took out the personnel, the machinery out, and they actually put a drone up to, you know, make a video of the failure as well. Uh, so yeah, that's that's just highlights like how you know high technologies uh, they they have to you know actually make sure their personnel is safe. Yeah, I mean, and it's just it's really incredible their their monitoring capabilities, just being able to not only predict you know a, within a few hours that the failure to so that they have the drone up there to watch it, but yeah, no no personnel or equipment was damaged, and this obviously it's a huge failure. So being able to manage that is an impressive uh, impressive feat. But yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. use... For sure, you know, they use a concept called inverse uh, velocities. You know, they basically, you know, have the monitoring and they have the live radar as well, and they kind of project that to figure out, okay, when exactly it's, it's going to fail. Mm -hmm. And that's why three days before that, you know, they were able to take every, take everyone out. And they also have a system called TARP. They have like TARP 1, 2, 3, and 4. Basically, after, when they pass TARP 2, the mining would stop. And then at TARP 4, it's basically evacuating every, everyone and then preparing for the failure. So yeah, like they, uh, I think they have some, you know, papers uh, around that top system too, that, you know, mm -hmm. you can uh, take a look. Uh, great, so like, you know, just talking about the failure mechanism over there, you know, uh, they, they have these terminologies, block one, block two, and block three, that just, you know, defines the stages of failure or which one failed first. So uh, as you can see over there, the blue over there, just come here for, 
Yeah, thank you. I can answer it better. So uh, in that part of the page, we have this setting over here that's called log fault. It's pretty, you know, clay fault running up the slope all the way to the top. And that was the main driver for the failure that the failure initiated right here up top. And this whole mass continued to go down. Then with the, you know, the uh, big, you know, on his Therapies that we can see over here and the rock mass, it got transitioned to the intrusive units like, you know, Monzonite and PQM, that's that's what they are called. And then, you know, basically it, it took out the part two as well. And this block three just came along the failure just because of, you know, that confinement that was removed right in front of it. So, you know, if you go to the next side, we can see a thermal imagery as well. Uh, so I'm going to talk on the video too. So if you forget on the top, you can see that the, the top just started to go, then the middle part, and then the bottom, you know, moved, you know, at the end when everything was failed down. This again. <laughs> Great. So now that, you know, we kind of understand the failure and we did the, uh, the field observations, now that is the time for the back analysis. So first thing, as Anike mentioned, we need to do a data review. We need to figure out, okay, what do we have in the model? So, you know, that is the area that we focus on for the model, which is right at the vicinity of the Leo failure. And it's kind of the focus of their, you know, predictive mining too. But that model was originally made to calibrate the Leo failure and also will be used, you know, for the predictive, you know, design evaluation as well. We can see we have uh, so many geology units, you know, 20 years worth of like surface and cell mappings, six different versions of GSI block models that were developed by different consultants. Now they have like one pit white block model, thankfully, but back in the day, it was like, you know, you know, across the pit. And so yeah, basically we had to like manage all that, you know, with the methods that on it presented and now just focusing on the model construction part. So, you know, as we said, we wanted to automate and we wanted to have the boss QAQC, but what? That is basically, you know, the answer to that. Like, you know, in this, you know, flag 3D models or these mining projects, we do want to have the option to scale up or down. Imagine we were focusing on that quarter model. Imagine something else also happens in the pit and they want to, you know, want us to focus on that. We can easily, with this process in place, just change our model extent. Or, you know, we could, you know, update our geologies because these bigger peaks, they update their geology fast every quarter. So every time we have to rebuild the model, but if we don't have that automated process, it's gonna take a long time over and over again. Um, and the second part, sure, we do the automation, but we make sure that, you know, we record all the scripts, you know, we use, for example, the Bitfocal or GitHub to upload the code and make sure it's recorded, you know, throughout the process. And there is people that actually look at the code and make sure that it's QA. And if that is QA and verified, then the process is now in place. It doesn't matter which mine you are applying that process to or which data you use. The process is, you know, impact. And which all of that resulted in cost savings, in time savings, in you know, increase efficiency in the model, which, you know, is always tight in terms of the timing because, like, you know, the minds want the answer quick all the time. So in the next slide, this is just showing you an overview of the model. The left is the sort of the cube, and then it did, it did, you know, the mesh generation. I didn't want to go to too much details here because, you know, it would be like, you know, an hour to just go through the models. But if you go to the next one, that's just a section that, you know, on the left, we have the DXF, you know, um, overlaid with the model to just show the geologies. This is just highlighting, you know, the mesh quality and if we are capturing the, you know, undulations of these different units. Uh, going to the next one, that, that's just, you know, I wanted to like, you know, uh, summarize all the process that we have for flag 3D model. You know, we had the characterization, we had the monitoring. Okay, now what should we do in the model? You know, first thing we do is a mesh development. You know, we, ge we generate the mesh, we use the features, you know, you know, to make refinements around it. That's all good, you know. 
and then we do like you know uh, we group the model based upon our geology solids and the and the faults or the structural domain. Then there are these two stages that we take care of, you know, which is one elastic and the other one is elastic yeah. stage. The, the elastic is just for us to develop our initial stresses to assign the boundary conditions or to, you know, initi initiate the poor pressures, right? So, for example, imagine we want to calibrate this, um, you know, failure which, which happened at, in May 2021. But they have been mining in, in Bingham since like 1920. So that is our like first stage that we start with and we come down and we excavate the down to get to the actual stage that we want to calibrate, which that is that classic stage. Once we are done with the uh, elastic initializations, we assign our like hook brown or more yeah. properties, you know, to the geologies or to the faults. We, we, we apply the anisotherapies and we do, you know, the salt you know, in, uh, in, in plastic stage. And then, you know, we keep excavating to get to the stage that we actually want to perform calibrations on. Next one, we get to the calibration. We do one more. Yeah, so, you know, as we, we, we have been mentioning from the beginning, you know, when we are doing the modeling or the characterization or the monitoring, these three are, you know, interconnected together. We can't just do modeling and don't know anything about the characterization or vice versa. You know, yes, there are people that you know would you know take on each of these stages, but they commun communicate and we make sure that once we like run a model and get some results, we validate that against the sub monitoring. And also, okay, sure, we've got the right amount of behavior, but do we actually get the right properties in there that is consistent with the characterization or not? So like these are all these loops or battles that we fight to be able to first, you know, get the representative properties and also get the representative behavior in the model. We go to the next one. These are the targets that we look at when we, you know, uh, did the calibration for Leo. Stability, as, uh, as I mentioned, they've been monitoring that since March, 2020. So we wanna see this gradual reduction in instability as well. Stable in March, reduces the stability in end of year 2020, and the failure in May 2021. Next, next target is actual, you know, obviously the shape and depth of the failure that we try to capture. So that's like one of the most important things that we look at. Then the failure direction. Sometimes in numerical models, we can get the numerical instability or the failure, but they don't use the correct controls or they don't use, they don't have, you know, show the correct direction of movements, which, which is also very important to have confidence in your model that is actually using the controls that we saw in the field and also replicate the movements that we see because they also have the radars and prisms and they can find out the direction. So that's what they will be compared as well. Okay, for the next one, there's just one section to just show that like, you know, the red is from the model, the black is from the, the field, just to show the comparison and the things that we look at. We go to the next one, we have some more results. This is just a st stability trend that I was talking about. You know, uh, in the main stage, you can see, first of all, when you want to look at the failures or instabilities in flag 3D or any numerical models, we look at the velocities. The velocities would indicate the instantaneous, you know, numerical stability of the, of the model. If these are high, that means that your model is still moving. It's not at equilibrium. So that is the criteria that we use to judge the, the stability. If you go to the next one, um, this is now like the failure, you know, uh, stability margins. What we have, you know, is that like we say, okay, uh, at the SRF of one, I don't know if everyone you know knows the SRF term, but that's just the same you know equivalent of the factor of safety, right? So we say okay, if we have our base case here, you know the whole that part on the on the dark area would go. If we just push it a notch, you know that block one would pop up, and then when we have the a one of five SRF or the, the stability margin, the full mechanism comes in. This is because we say okay, the trigger for these two blocks to come down was this first one. So this first part of the failure, you know, failed first and resulted in failure of the others. And 
remember, we're not, you know, modeling it dynamically. So in this, you know, static models, we should be able to know, okay, uh, how we can, you know, get the full failure, which is with this SRF of, or factor of safety of 105. It's like just a 5% reduction of, you know, our property. And this is just a glance of the critical controls that we have for this, um, you know, uh, failures. As I mentioned, the fall, the big rock mass, and the sets are playing a role here. You know, and this is just something that I want to highlight. Sure, we have those, you know, controls, and we, you know, try to use something to make our model to fail right over there. But then we, you know, come here and we figure out if that set actually exists in the steadiness or in our data. Right, and then you can see that, for example, like if I take an example, this rebel set between, you know, uh, 331 was the major, you know, structure that, that you know, helped the failure to transition from the fault um, uh, that was on the west side and all the way down to the, you know, east side. Uh, just, you know, uh, to mention, basically, this work was a parallel, you know, analysis, you know, between us and also IPASCO. This is just a comparison between the models. Both models were successful in, rep in replicating the mechanisms. Itasco used a different, you know, um, computation. They used the, you know, the strain softening technique. We used the perfectly plastic, which they both have values in different, you know, stages. And even though we use like different, you know, strategies and approaches, we sort of end ended up in a similar ballpark. Uh, helpful for the client because then they feel a little more confident <laughs> yeah because like in this type of you know projects they do want to have two consultants at at least to do the analysis to you know uh, manage the risk and you know minimize the, the errors and this is just also you know showing the prisms comparisons you know the green or the simulated if between the two and the blue or the observed you can see there's like a, a good correlation between the model and observations and just you know at the end before like we finish just want to acknowledge you know um uh, our colleagues in Rio Tinto that you know allowed us to you know present these results and also WSP uh, that you know basically you know we did most of the, the that analysis while we were over there and also you know um, I think this is the last slide that you know we have uh, and thanks so much for your time and coming to this session. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Okay. Oh. Reminder that uh, Kate and Bijan will be after the presentation. They might want to answer questions concerning hiring in the equilibrium. They will have students with us. So if you have questions about Getting a job at the given you will wait outside of the location. For sure. Okay. Yeah. So Christian, so the radar and all the drones that they use. It's not in-house actually. So no. uh, yeah, it's the, the mines, it's the mines radars. I mean, it depends on the it depends on the radar that they're using. Uh, but I mean, there you go. Ground probe and arc star. Yeah, yeah, and they they also yeah they have some arc star IDS yeah. software as well. So they have, they have multiple different types of radars. Um, yeah, it depends on you know the mm -hmm. the monitoring needs. It's going to depend on the size of the operation um, with such a large. Uh, mine. Not only do they like a little bit of redundancy in their consultants, but also redundancy in their monitoring equipment. So, um, yeah, for them, it's worth it to spend that. I, I have also a suggestion. Maybe most of us know that those technologies. They, yeah, they have that as well, actually. They have the install, but the, the thing is, these radars in place, you know, they help with the live, you know, uh, the, the formations and behaviors of the slope. The install is 
used for a more long term, you know, yeah. pattern of the, the formations, but these are very, you know, helpful for their day to day operations. yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, we know that there's a sampling bias towards, you know, when you're collecting your, uh, you know, rock samples, sometimes you tend to get the highest, you know, highest strength or more competent samples. It's easier to collect them. Um, you know, sometimes people in the field can do a little bit better job of making sure that we're getting a wide range, but particularly for some of the sites we look at where there's really um, argillically altered material, it's really hard to collect those samples. Um, so when we look at plotting up that data, we're getting, we know we're getting much stronger results because the, the truly argillically altered samples are just not collectible. They're falling apart. They're not making it to the lab. Um, and so in those cases, we try and look at other sources of data to get to complement that or, you know, try and use our understanding of sampling bias to either downgrade the data or use, you know, point load test data or other, you know, look at, yeah, look at other data. So we just try and take that into account, um, you know, based on our understanding of the rock mass and the practices of a given site. Um, yeah. So, uh, so far the graph are instance in which the bias may are perfectly intended to probably older. Uh, data I got from the field in order to government as it's usually the model properties are a lot lower than the characters property. That that's that's the case. And that could be due to the you know sampling bias too. Mm -hmm. And maybe like, you know, from a big area, we only have two samples. Are they actually representative of that whole area? That's also the question. Yeah, and so yeah, no, we always look into how to downgrade it based on other characteristics, you know, such as alteration or the hardness, the logged hardness or the logged micro defect intensity. Um, yeah, when we know there could pop, like where sampling bias issues could be particularly, um, particularly affect the, the material. <laughs> So uh, do you have like any automated way to calibrate your models or like, do you still do in the Excel sheet, like vary the properties and look at the behavior of the model? Like Yeah, so, you know, uh, as you said, like one of, one way is to, for each each time that the model runs, we interpret the results and then we figure out the next step. Yeah. But there's another method that, that is being used in hydrogeology a lot, which is called HEST. We can you know search that too. That is actually trying to it doesn't so that test can be applied to any different sort of uh, model you have hydrogeology or geotechnical. So we use that too for if uh, like um, you know how we have big models. We make different window models that is in a, a smaller scale so that we, we can you know run so many iterations quickly. And then with that and with that test tool, the test tool would just you know. You know how we have two bounds of the matter of, of the property and we get the bound in between. It doesn't do that, you know, linearly. It does like you know some mathematical calculations to find the closest answer to what our target is. Okay. And how do you get rid of the non-uniqueness in the calibration, right? You can get the knowledge. So I know like for back analysis it's better. But like for future prediction, right? Using the numerical model, I guess like it can be like sometimes. And that's know, definitely the, the challenge, but we can get this calibration 10 other times, 10, 10 other ways, right? Mm -hmm. But the main thing is that we have to, you know, make sure we check to the, to that, you know, model, to the slope monitoring and make sure that the controls that we see in actual, in the field are the ones that we see in the model too. For example, if the, if in the field it says it's controlled by the water, 
you know, and they have so much, they have a precipitation that like they before and that part failed, right? Mm -hmm. If you can't have that in the model, that means that there is a disconnect there. And for sure, like in terms of the predictives, it just depends on how reliable is your data that you have, like, you know, do we have enough drill holes? Do we have enough like ATVs to actually like, you know, show that uh, 10 years from now, how the, that the slope looks like. And kind of to like, you know, prevent that issue, we do the modeling every year. You know, as we go and, and we collect the data, we upgrade it, we use the latest characterization to kind of, you know, fill that gap. But well, that's a good question for sure. Yeah, and if there is a, you know, a gap between, you know, what they had to do to get the model to work and, you know, what we saw when we just first put together the data, it's a good trigger point to say, should we be looking at this data differently? Should we be split, splitting it out? Should it be grouped different? Is there some other parameter we need to be looking at that we missed before or we didn't, you know, include or, and that's a, you know, in that way, if we can align, you know, like we were trying to say there, if we can align the, the monitoring results with, you know, the modeling results with the characterization, just based on looking at the data, that gives us a lot more confidence that then like moving forward to the next like predictive phase, we can, apply those parameters a little bit a little bit more widely and you also do a big range of sensitivities to account for that too mm -hmm. yeah okay you have another question yeah i'm curious how you use the micro seismic data in your model collaboration or what you've seen as far as best practice in incorporating micro seismic data it's become canyon as a pretty recent micro seismic yeah for this type of analysis that we have that are pretty static I have, we have never used that micro seismic data, but for sure, those are helpful for their sort of top developments for their, you know, um, monitoring as well. But in, in terms of this type of static models and larger scales, we, we haven't used, you know, the study, but maybe that would be an opportunity, you know, for us to get, to gain more, you know, understanding of the, of the field. Okay. Any other question? Yeah. 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 The slope and geometry was very critical, not so much the height, because we couldn't like change the height or, or anything, but in terms of the um, or the deep direction of the slope, if, if that is, is clear, because of if we have like a certain deep direction of the slope, the different you know anisotropy orientations could become critical for us. Mm -hmm. And actually that is something that you know Bingham is considering to prevent the failures to actually change that angle. To you know, come to the side that you know those sets or those beddings that they have is not as critical. So we did you know evaluate in the design evaluation part in terms of you know the angle of the IRA or the internal angle, the height as you mentioned. Do we need to step out or no? Do we need, need to change that you know orientation of the slope or not? Those are all the things that, that you know would came after the back analysis. Uh -huh. So bottom line is you could have predicted this, right? Uh, with your work. Uh, be, so that before the failure, you know, the models, the historical models that was over here was mainly south wall and east wall. There was actually a gap right in there for both modeling and characterization. Because the one thing that we should note is that the model can only do so much if you don't have the, you know, the data. The model can really do it. We can run sensitivities and you know and show you the bounds and saying the low lower bound, higher bound, this is happening. But there wasn't like a focus on that southeast wall just prior to this, you know, failure. And the hope is also with a lot of these like efficiency improvements, it becomes a little bit more practical to be running these models and checking more areas and running more cases. Um, so hopefully. Warning them. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the way that we model the faults, we use isotropically weak elements. 
So we have a, a, a zone of the weak element or the weak zone around each fault surface. And uh, we, we use arc three mesh. We didn't use tetrahedral or any difference just because of the scale of the model. But for example, around those areas, we use 25 feet resolution to capture that, which, you know, it was adequate with this scale, but that could go lower too. But we were, you know, a bit, you know, limited in terms of the sun rotations too. And, you know, basically just have to make a balance. We could go to 12.5 as well, you know, but that wouldn't add much value because, the, for example, the failure was 140 feet or 120 feet, you know, and depth, right? And uh, we, when we looked at the model versus the actual, you know, fault surface, we, we realized that with this current resolution, we can capture the undulations and the, you know, shape of the fault, you know, accurately enough to perform the calibration. Another question? Yeah. So did you build the model in black or did you import it from another software? In, in black. In yeah, black. Everything was in black. So, you know, as a common practice, we have, you know, Greater, we have Rhino, that, you know, we generate the mesh, those are, you know, professional software for, you know, mesh generation, and then we bring them here. But since we didn't use the tetrahedral, you know, mesh uh, zones, we didn't yes. need to. And the other fact is that we wanted this whole process to be automated. So we basically, every time we get a new picture or a new geology, yeah. we just click a button and, and then import it and run the whole thing. But with those softwares, we have to, you know, mesh it first and then bring it in. And that was something that, you know, the mind also emphasized that we want this to be reproducible, to be like, you know, yeah. quickly being able to like, you know, update the model and go forward. That Isn't was it, it complex to build it in flag? Huh? Isn't it complex to build in flag? Sure, but like the thing is that if, since like, you know, for example, flag uses Python too right now, yeah. we use Python as well, like, you know, to do that. I, I, I think the only part time that we use like the internal language is when we actually want to use the geometry. But with Python, we can actually, and streamline all the processes. The process is complex as a whole, but then we break it down to like 10 steps, then we can tackle each at a time and, and you know, optimize. That's what, you know, we have to do, but for sure, this is like a time consuming and complex. For example, the model is around like for 12, 12 hours, like six hours to actually build the model for the first time, 12 hours for the computation. Good job, thank you. Okay, um, quickly. Dr. Nelson provided a link for the book on this one. Uh, you can see it uh, rise to the occasion. You can download it. Yeah. I think it's on the main page. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, so the... this one? Uh, the one. Yeah, that one. Yeah. That's probably main fake because Leo, Leo's too. Yeah. So you have some questions online. Uh, Dr. Jamal was saying if you can use the flag for general rock flow stability. Okay, that's just a recommendation. And then you have one more question here. This one. Yeah. Uh, so Bingham uses this general stress field that is rotated 37 degrees from the mine node. That was what we used. And in terms of the ratios of the vertical and horizontal, we have 0.5. If I can remember 0.5 and 0.8, if I remember correctly. So it's not uh, just one to one to one ratio as like a default. We did, they, they did have institute, you know, testing and they gave us basically those uh, values. And we did try actually both, you know, the mine, you know, a certain um, condition and also the default. It doesn't make big difference in these shallow areas because like it's only 100, 100 feet deep. So difference in terms of the ratios between the horizontal stresses and vertical doesn't make a big difference in this shallower, you know, mechanism. But it does when you when you go deeper. So we, you know, kind of end end up with the mind, you know, institute stresses. Yeah. The second question they say is, uh, have you applied the same procedure on other worlds for oh, yeah. forward analysis? Uh, are, are we applying the same procedure for forward analysis? Oh, yeah, for sure. The main thing is that right now, the model that is built and calibrated, minimal effort is needed. The only thing that we have to do is to have pictures, you know, and we can evaluate them in, in the model. So we do run sensitivities on the predictive cases, but, you know, we don't really change the material properties, you know, when we run the, like, the, you know, annual 
you know, stages of uh, mining progression. Yeah. And for the demo's question, I forgot. I think it's a, I don't think it's a question, do we? Would you recommend the use of flag? Yeah. I mean, the main thing is that flag 3D, if, you know, being used within that streamlined process, it can be used in anything because it's a, like, you know, FDM software that can model, you know, everything. But when it comes to like bench scale design or interamp scale design, you know, you, you don't really need to go all the way to like a you nomad know, model. You can actually cap capture that very well with the existing, you know, conventional tools. And um, yeah, I think, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, which software you're comfortable with. That's, that's, that's the bottom line. Okay, I think we have to end it here and uh, say thank you. Yes, I know you only did mention your property. I don't think you